When fire strikes, it is often seen as an uncaring force that attacks without mercy. Yet fire is neither malicious nor evil. It is only given these attributes when seen from a human perspective, when lives and property go up in flames. More than one million square kilometers in size, Ontario is Canada's second largest province. More than 80% of it is covered by some variety of forest. In the late 1800s, the immigration of European settlers to Ontario's northern regions increases dramatically. One example of this is the clay belt that stretches between the towns of Matheson and Cochrane, a few hundred kilometers north of North Bay. Here, homesteads spring up all along the Temiskaming rail line as settlers turn patches of forest into farmland. Surveys were, were done, including the ones around Matheson, where the clay belt had been discovered. This was a region that was supposed to be good for farming development. Matheson itself would have been a service town for the, uh, the area. It had a few hundred residents by this time. A small town growing to serve the surrounding area in which farmers were settling and agricultural development was taking place. It had its share of fires along the way as every small town and, uh, with the wooden structures. Fire becomes a fact of life in the Matheson area and sometimes death. In July 1911, fire sweeps through the communities of South Porcupine and Cochrane, destroying 1,600 square kilometers of forest. It kills 70 people and leaves 3,000 homeless. But the worst is yet to come. The summer of 1916 reminds many Northerners of another summer five years earlier. Heavy rains in May and June give way to one of the hottest Julys on record. Settlers take advantage of the dry weather to burn away heavy brush. Forest fires were common because settlers were clearing the land and so you would see smoke all the time. And uh, people became rather blasé about it because there was always smoke, there was always fire, it was just a, a fact of life. Many settlers take comfort in the fact that since 1911, larger sections of forest have been cut or burned. Some towns have their own water tower and volunteer fire brigade. Fire management uh, was largely a matter of fire control at the time. In the summertime, railways had accepted the obligation to have fire rangers along their line and to do their best to put out fires whenever they occurred. July 29. 1916, another hot, dry, smoky day. Fires had been uh, burning in the, the region for the past two weeks. The locomotive engineers were rolling through this area spoke of the fires that uh, they noted, the smoke that prevailed, the heat that uh, was also uh, marking these days. Crown Land Agent Frank Ginn has his concerns. Before leaving for his office in nearby Matheson, he tells his family to take refuge in a nearby swamp should fire come close to the house. On a farm just outside Matheson, William Dowson helps a neighbor mix concrete for cement blocks. He notices that the cement has no trouble drying in the intense heat. At 11 o'clock a.m., we were forced to close work on account of the high winds which kept steadily increasing. We took shelter in the tool shed where we had lunch and sat chatting. For Simon Omont, it's another sweltering day working his quarter section near the village of Nushka. My mother was the seventh child of a family of 10. Her father was Simon Lawrence Omont and uh, she had five brothers and four sisters. The youngest was four months old and the oldest was 16 years old. Not far away, residents attend mass in Nushka. 
It was a very small town. A lot of French Canadian families had moved from Quebec. They were working on building a church and having their own church. The new priest in town, Father Wilfred Gagné, leads the service. Father Gagné has just attended a retreat in the south and was urged by colleagues not to return home because of the fire risk. And as uh, the day advanced, uh, people went out and about their affairs, went shopping and so on, noted the smoke, but uh, rather took it for granted until the middle of the day when it uh, suddenly became clear that uh, the smoke was thicker. One of the workmen called our attention to a black cloud far over the treetops. We all decided it was a thundercloud, so paid no more attention to it, until a wave of heat and a thick pall of smoke struck the shed with such force that it almost collapsed. Suddenly they became aware of uh, more heat and the uh, roaring of the uh, flames suddenly becomes audible and uh, they begin to realize that uh, the small fires uh, join together into a much larger one. Wind is the culprit, whipping smaller fires into one ravenous monster that moves relentlessly towards the communities of the clay belt. July 29th, 1916. Homesteader William Dowson races along the railway tracks, not far from the town of Matheson, Ontario. When I passed through Matheson, the men were preparing for the fight. Every available utensil that would hold water was being filled by the wagons, drawing it from the Black River, which runs through the town. Matheson wouldn't have had very much in the way of uh, fire fighting equipment. They had the river, and if the flames really uh, appeared in, in, to threaten the, the community and people's lives, people could always head for the river and get into it. What the citizens of Matheson can't foresee is the incredible wind that feeds on the flames. An irresistible front of flame is soon developed, and it sweeps forward, devouring the forest before it like the dry grass in a running prairie fire. In minutes, Matheson is in the eye of a blazing storm. You would have thick smoke. You would have flying embers. Uh, and I can envision with the wind and the noise of the fire, it would be terrifying. Land agent Frank Ginn is part of a group of townspeople who head for the Black River. Some huddle beneath the bridge, trying to hide from the heat and smoke. The only other avenue of escape is a freight train at the edge of town. Women and children are lifted into wooden boxcars as flames threaten Matheson Station. Thelma Miles' mother is eight years old at the time. She uh, didn't have her any clothes on, hardly except a little cotton dress, and she remembered running up with her mother up to the hill. There was about an inch of silt everywhere, and she remembered this silt coming up between her toes as she ran. As the train starts to move, passengers stuff wet cloths in the cracks of the boxcars to keep the smoke out, screaming as the freight punches through the wall of flame. Well, my mother recalls it was extremely hot because there were so many people pushed into this boxcar type of thing. And uh, the burning wood on the outside of the train and everything, I guess it was a pretty scary ride. Outside Matheson, William Dowson arrives at the homestead he shares with friend Les Hall. Les and his mother are building a shelter out of boxes and a wet tarpaulin. The flames would mount hundreds of feet into the air, driving the smoke away for a moment and letting the sun shine down on us. But its light was a ghastly, pale death color. And I felt better when the smoke closed in again and shut it off. 
At the Ginn homestead, Frank Ginn's wife and daughters huddle in the house as fire sweeps towards them. The heat is so intense that windows on the burning chicken coops melt into balls of glass. Hundreds of thousands of acres are now burning along the clay belt. The hardest hit is the village of Nushka, just north of Matheson. While some are able to escape by train, many more decide to stay. The men chose to stay and the wives would not leave because they didn't want to leave their, their husbands. And um, they chose to stay because they wanted to fight for what they had had already, their animals, their barns, their homes. Kim McGuire's grandfather, Simon Omont, is working his quarter section outside Nushka when the fire hits. He races home to save his wife and nine of their children. A tenth child, Irene, is not at home. My mother was visiting her uncle, Joseph Omont, and his family, and he led them out of the house to the well and they took blankets from the home and wet the blankets and covered themselves with the blanket and spent the, the duration of the fire in, in the well. Not far away, the Gauthier family finds refuge in nearby Brown Lake. One can imagine the terror they must have felt. Uh, the children's feet were becoming uh, burned. It was smoky thick smoke, uh, hard to breathe, and so they had a flat bottom boat, a punt, and they all got on the punt. Mrs. Goche became quite uh, ill and unwell and kept fainting, and then the pump sank. Uh, the smoke still came at them. They pulled up their shirts and uh, wetted them and put them over their heads and uh, tried to breathe through the wet material. In the village of Nushka, Father Wilfred Gagné rallies those left behind with a plan of escape. Now, Father Gagné was a theologian and knew little of the mechanics of fire, but he had the very best of intentions, and they went into the clay cut. And when they got there, he advised them to lie down, get as low to the ground as possible, and as the fire uh, roared over, Hopefully, they would be safe. Farther south, the homestead shared by William Dowson and Les Hall is on fire, and the heat beneath their tarpaulin shelter is unbearable. By this time, it was difficult to breathe. Come on, Les, let's get out of this, I shouted, and disappeared into the smoke. Dowson leaves the clearing, but very quickly finds himself sandwiched between two giant shafts of flame. There's no smoke, it's all flame. My eyes are wide open and I can hardly see. Oh, if I was only back, it must be cool in the clearing. Yes, I will try. Oh God, will you help me? July 29th, 1916. A storm of fire unleashes its fury on the clay belt between Matheson and Cochrane, Ontario. As quickly as the firestorm comes, it moves on, leaving behind a stark and gutted landscape. In the clearing that was once his homestead, the body of William Dowson lies in the clay of a potato patch. When I opened my eyes again, I was looking up at a clear spot of sky straight above me. The bush was gone. Dowson finds the makeshift shelter still intact. His friend Les Hall and Les's mother are still alive. Not far away, Frank Ginn arrives at his farm just outside Matheson. He finds his family safe. Their place was built on a knoll, and the fire, for some reason, went around the knoll. And Nothing was burned on their place. On her uncle's farm, five-year-old Irene Omont has also survived. Unfortunately, 
As her father, Simon Aumont, has already discovered, Irene's own family has not been so lucky. By the time he got to his home, his wife and the children had suffocated right behind the door. The youngest child was four months old and was still breathing. He picked him up in his arms and uh, ran to the field with him. And on his way to the field, he tripped over some wire fencing and um, fell to the ground and he lost consciousness. And when he woke up, it was night and the baby had died. <laughs> Sunday, July 30th, 1916. The clay belt between Matheson and Cochrane is a smoldering ruin. It will have been a desolate country. Of course, completely isolated. Uh, the uh, fire burned ties on the, the railway, it, uh, it could warp the, the rails themselves, and that happened uh, to some extent. The fire uh, burned poles for uh, the telegraph lines, and so the telegraph communication was out for uh, points further north. I went to see if anything remained of Matheson. There is nothing north of the tracks, and that was nearly all of Matheson swept away, all of it. It would be a, a gutted out shell. The only thing you'd probably see would be uh, if they had a stone foundation, it would be there. There were three buildings, I think. Three or four buildings that didn't get the fire. One of those homes is the brick house of John Hugh. The Hugh family pitches in to help those less fortunate. The house was standing and it was turned into a hospital and that's a lot, all the, all, everything in the house would, was turned into bandages. And my mother, I remember, she uh, had a bunch of goose grease stored away in the, in the basement. And she would use this on the burns. So. Yeah, so they were, they were busy. In just a few short hours, fire has devastated over 200,000 hectares of northern Ontario, its communities in ruins. Having survived in the shallow waters of Brown Lake, the Gauthier family heads for the village of Nushka in search of food and shelter. And as they came near to Nushka, they noticed that the small community was no more. Uh, and so they went through the clay cut, which was just an opening that the railway had made through this small hill. Lying in that railway cut on either side were, well, dead bodies. There were 57 men, women and children. They had asphyxiated. Uh, the rush of the fire had taken away the oxygen. And so they were all unmarked, and they were just lying there. The greatest loss is that of Simon Aumont, who must say goodbye to his wife and nine children. Only five-year-old daughter Irene survives. It was devastating for him to lose his family, and he, he was very thoughtful about uh, how he wanted my mother's future to go, and. He wanted her to be very well educated and uh, be able to sustain herself because she would have no family around her. The official death toll is 223, but many believe that number to be much higher. There were people in the area who may not have been known to others. Unless there were survivors who knew them, they would have to settle for the fact that some of them were simply unknown. Just bodies without names. Some blame the government for not providing adequate fire protection and for allowing the haphazard burning of land without supervision. They were faced with mixed bush, mixed trees, and they uh, did not have the manpower to cut them down. So they simply burned off parts of the land 
to clear the ground. Within a year of the tragedy, the government passes the first Forest Fires Prevention Act, which lays the foundation for today's fire prevention legislation. And the system of uh, fire rangers was developed further, inspectors were appointed, the system of districts was refined, and the government moved towards uh, close seasons, towards requiring permits from people before they set fires. And in these various ways, the Ontario government did try to prevent uh, settlers' activities getting out of hand. In 1920, the village of Nushka changes its name to Val Gan, in honor of the young priest who tried to save the lives of his parishioners on that terrible day in July 1916. Most of the surviving families remain in the area, accepting government assistance to rebuild their homes and their lives. They always referred to the 1916 fire, and, and uh, consequently the 29th of uh, July, I always remember, you know, like a Armistice Day. Uh, they seemed to be quite proud, you know, that, uh, like going through a war, that they come out of it, and. Uh, they did, they did the best they could.